In this third section, we're going to look more closely at some specification tests for the presence of spatial effects in probit and tobit models, and then the actual estimation. And we'll first talk about the specification tests, primarily Lagrange multiplier test, then a general discussion of estimation strategies and a review of a number of different approaches, and then two more technical and detailed discussions of maximum likelihood estimation and Bayesian estimation. And these are very technical, so uh, there's a lot of notation, and I won't repeat all the notation, but I'll give you in a nutshell what, what it means. So let's start with the specification tests. And we've already seen, when we discussed specification tests for spatial effects in the linear regression model, that a very effective way to approach this is to use the Lagrange multiplier principle because that um, only requires estimation under the null. And since we have um, already seen in the discussion of the classic probit and tobit that the preferred estimation method is maximum likelihood, we have all the tools there uh, to get started. So we can uh, take the uh, maximum likelihood first-order conditions and second-order conditions and construct the Lagrange multiplier statistics, or we can approach it slightly differently and actually take Moran's eye, which we know is very similar to a Lagrange multiplier statistic. It's actually a scaled form of it. Take Moran's eye and uh, generalize it to the case of these latent variable models. Now, in order to do that, we need the counterpart of a concept of a residual. And we've already discussed this a little bit in the context of the probe, but let's revisit it here um, a little more closely. So the problem is the true error term is the difference between the unobserved latent dependent variable, y sub i star, and then the predicted value, x i beta. But so we don't have that. What we have instead is the difference between a one or a zero and this uh, probability that we get from the cumulative standard normal. And um, that is what is operational, what we can work to it. Now, the problem is this um, is a heteroscedastic error term. The error term is, in fact, um, a, a binomial random variable, and we can um, see that its variance is uh, p times 1 minus p, just as in any kind of binomial. And let's just keep that in mind for now, where, of course, the p is not constant, but varies with each observation. It's the phi sub i, where phi sub i is the cumulative normal evaluated at x sub i beta. So we have this value, we'll plug it into cumulative standard normal, we get a probability, then the um, because it isn't really a realization of a binomial process, it happens or it doesn't happen, uh, we know that its variance is uh, of this particular form. So, but we know we um, already discussed the concept of a generalized residual, which is like a weighted form of the naive residual, where the weights come directly from the first order conditions. So the weights W sub i are the density of the standard normal divided by uh, phi sub i times 1 minus phi sub i, where those are the probabilities, so the cumulative probabilities. Um, the variance, because it's a product of a, uh, a constant times a random variable, is the constant square times the variance of the random variable. And after some algebra, this turns out to be the density squared in the numerator, and then the familiar p times 1 minus p in the um, denominator. So again, the generalized residual as well has a non-constant variance. The, the error term that it corresponds with has a non-constant variance. So um, in the literature, there have been three different concepts of a residual that operationalize this concept for the probit model. Um, 
One is the one we've already seen, the naive one, um, the difference between 0 or 1, the observed 0 or 1, and the predicted uh, probability. The second one is a standardized form of this. So as we uh, mentioned, this is um, really um, heteroscedastic. So if we divide it by the square root of its variance, then we have a, a standard standardized residual with a variance of 1, and that's what the second expression does. It divides the naive residual by the square root of p times 1 minus p. And then the generalized Cox-Snell residual uses this um, weight in front of the naive residual with the density of the standard normal divided by p times 1 minus p. So these are the three different ways in which we operationalize this in, in, a, in a testing procedure. The most general uh, test framework was developed by Collegian and Prucha in a Journal of Econometrics article in 2001. And it generalizes the concept of the moran zai statistic where we recognize the numerator is the familiar numerator with the residual um, transpose times the weights matrix times the residual. So this is a quadratic form in the weights matrix. The interesting part is the denominator. We call it here gamma, where gamma is a standardization. And so the key for both the probit and the tobit is to figure out what is the correct standardization of this uh, quadratic form in the residuals. And in this particular case, the residuals are the naive residuals because the standardization is done in the gamma expression. And under the proper conditions, Collegian and Pucher show that this uh, moran i goes asymptotically to a standard normal distribution. So then we're in business. Uh, I won't dwell on the derivations. They're fairly complex, but I want to give you a sense of what these statistics look like. So the Moran's I for the probit model is the, the familiar numerator with the quadratic form in the residuals. And in our notation, we use E sub 1 as the naive residuals. And then the standardization is the square root of the trace of two very complicated matrix products uh, consisting of the weights and the variance covariance matrix. And uh, they're identical except for the transpose, so W sigma W sigma and W prime sigma W sigma. It actually technically would be W prime sigma prime W sigma, but it doesn't matter since sigma is diagonal, uh, it's the same as its transpose. In practice, we often take the square of this expression, which is then distributed as chi-square with one degree of freedom. So that's the square of the numerator, the cross product in the quadratic form in the numerator, and then the trace term in the denominator. And the variance covariance matrix sigma is um, diagonal, and it has the uh, p times 1 minus p values in the diagonal elements. So those are the estimates of the individual uh, variance for each observation. So with that in hand, we can uh, figure out this expression, and it's a chi-square with one degree of freedom, just like the other Lagrange multiplier tests in the standard linear regression model. Now, in the linear, linear literature, there are a couple of precursors of this test that are very similar but slightly different. So the Pinks' Slade article uses an, a Lagrange multiplier rationale and comes up with the numerator squared, but the residuals in the numerator are the standardized naive residuals. And as a result of that, the trace term no longer contains the sigma matrix, um, but is the usual expression in WW and W prime W that we've also seen in the linear regression context. So that the Pinks' Slade variety, they don't actually derive uh, asymptotic distribution. They use a bootstrap procedure 
for inference, but um, the expression is, is familiar. And then in a separate paper, actually a working paper that then was published in, uh, in an edited volume, uh, Pinksa had another version where he takes the generalized residual E3 and then um, uses a sigma to the fourth power term to approximate the the weighting in in the of the heteroscedastic error. So the sigma squared is the average of the variance terms of the generalized Cox Snell residuals. You might recognize this expression as the density squared divided by P times one minus P. These are summed for all the observations and then the average is taken. So that's how Pinksy finesses this issue of weighting, but if you can, um, with some algebra, you can see that they're all pretty much similar to this general expression used uh, by Collegian and Procha. So then in some simulation experiments, we uh, have obtained a sense of how good these things actually are, and um, in small, smaller samples, smallish samples, um, these tests can give different indications. But overall, we found that the generalized Miranda Krilijan Prucha form is the most reliable and it um, reaches its proper asymptotic distribution both uh, under the null and therefore is unbiased test statistic. The p values are correct. Uh, the LM tests also work, but they only really work well in very large samples, which is a typical result. So then we switch to the Tobit case, which is even more complicated. And again, Collegian and Prucha, uh, due to derivations of their generalized Moran statistic, the numerator is the um, same quadratic form we've seen before, but now the residuals are the complicated Tobit residuals. You see the complex expression there in, involving both um, the density of the normal standardized as well as the um, cumulative normal uh, standardized. So we need to compute these individual variants and the individual variance terms are no longer p times 1 minus p or anything simple like that. They are a very complex expression that you see on the low, lower part of the slide. Again, this involves um, the um, density of the standard normal and the cumulative of the standard normal. So this is a very complex expression, but uh, Tobit as such is already fairly complex. Uh, it involves these truncated distributions, which make things uh, difficult to track analytically. Um, we also did some experiments for the Tobit and found that this generalized test has the proper asymptotic distribution and the proper size, which means it's unbiased, for um, data sets with more than 100 observations, which is this day and age typically the case. They have good power. Uh, however, they are very sensitive to misspecification, particularly heteroscedasticity. And in other words, uh, it's the same problem again that we've seen earlier for Moran's eye in general. It's a great misspecification test, but it doesn't help you that much into formulating the alternative model. So the Tobit LM test or the Tobit generalized Moran test cannot really distinguish between the alternatives. It has power against lag dependence, our error dependence, as well as heteroscedasticity, which is um, very difficult in practice to then decide how to proceed. So this is in a nutshell the uh, testing strategy that we can follow. They're all basically <clears throat> derived from a generalized version of Moran's eye. The numerator is the familiar algebraic form, and then the denominator is some kind of standardization which involves traces of the weights matrices and the uh, estimated um, heteroscedastic terms.
Next, we turn to an overview of estimation strategies.